Hey, so after the popularity of my first tutorial on the AI of Hollow Knight's first boss fight, the False Knight, I decided to go for another round and recreate the second boss of the game, our beloved Hornet. This one is again a really well designed boss fight, as are pretty much all of them in the entire game. In contrast to the False Knight, Hornet is very small and agile, making for a much more fast paced fight requiring quick reactions. In this tutorial we will again use my 2D platformer base project, which you can download over at my Discord. This time we are also reusing a lot of the code and setup from last time, so if you haven't already, make sure to check out the first video before. Finally, as a disclaimer, we are using Behavior Designer, which is a plugin from the asset store that enables us to use behavior trees in Unity. Unfortunately, there is no free version available, but if you want a robust AI solution, I can definitely recommend buying it. Just like last time, I took some preparations in the asset department, so we can start with the behavior right away. Again, I separated all of Hornet's sprite animations and assembled them in an animation controller. The sprite sheet is again from Spriter's resource and of course for educational purposes only. It is a little more elaborate compared to the False Knight, but overall it's the same concept. Let's again start with analyzing the boss fight, making out Hornet's individual moves. First we have the dash. There is a regular ground dash and an air dash, where Hornet jumps up and dashes down either in a steep or in a more flat angle, depending on where the player is. Then we have the throw attack, where Hornet throws her needle towards the player and retracts it in both ways, able to hurt the player. And finally, there is the Gossamer Storm, as it's called on the Hollow Knight wiki. This spawns a guarding circle around Hornet, which hurts the player when touched. This attack can also be executed in mid-air. These are basically the main attacks. In addition, Hornet is also more agile than the False Knight, in that she's moving around the arena by either running or leaping. After 11 hits, the boss enters into a stagger, giving the player a short break before entering the next stage. Last time with the False Knight we had different movesets for different stages. This time it looks more like Hornet's moveset remains the same during the entire fight. However, it looks to me like she decides which attacks to make based on her relative location in the arena. For instance, the needle throw is usually executed from a corner and never from the center. Okay, so I think we are all set. Since we already have the false knight from last time in our project, let's take this one as our base. In the false knight scene, just copy the boss, then switch to our new scene with the green path boss arena and paste it in. First we replace the sprite with our new hornet sprite, where I have already set up all the sprite animations. We then adjust our collider to match hornet's size. We also tweak the rigid body values a little bit. We want a linear drag of 0.97 and a slightly higher gravity scale of 4. We don't need most of the child objects, but we will keep the hazard collider, which is the part that hurts the player when colliding. Let's also adjust the size to approximately fit inside the main collider. I've added a new component called boss config, which contains some metadata about the boss, including the name, a transform of the arena center, and the radius of the arena. The arena center transform is already in the scene. We will need those values later on. We can keep the behavior tree from the false knight as a base, but we'll rename it to hornet behavior. Finally, we rename our main object also to hornet. Now in the behavior tree, we can keep the basic structure, but we will remove all of the specific attacks from last time. Instead, let's start to implement the first move, which will be the ground dash. So last time we created a reusable action called jump, which we used a couple of times. Since the ground dash is essentially a jump with no vertical force, we can reuse that one here again. Let's just make a few adjustments in the code. First, we only used one animation trigger for the jump. Now with the dash, we want to have more control how long the buildup takes. So we need another trigger that after the buildup triggers the actual jump, in our case the dash animation. So now we have two trigger parameters, buildup and main animation. If we leave main animation blank, it assumes there is only one initial trigger, just like before. 
Additionally, we want to play a little visual effect when the dash happens. This effect is just an object with a sprite animation on it. I've added a helper method to the effect manager which instantiates such an effect and plays it once. And we can also pass an offset to this effect. And finally, to make sure the boss stands still after the dash, we reset the body's velocity to zero after the jump. So back in the behavior tree, let's add some values to our jump task. For horizontal force, I found a value of 55 works. Jump force, of course, zero. Build up time is about one second. Jump time, 0.2. And the two animation triggers, we can look up uh, in our animator. These are called start ground dash and ground dash respectively. And finally, uh, we have a jump effect. I've already set this up. This is called ground dash sparks. And we have a little bit of a vertical effect offset of 0 0.5. Finally, let's um, add this to a sequence. And before we are performing the jump, we want to make sure that Hornet is facing the player. And after it, we want to have a little bit of a weight. And finally, in our stage page selector, we have to remove the previous values. We only have one stage for now, and it's only using the first task with the index zero. Okay, so let's hit play and do our first little playtest. And it seems that our ground dash is working pretty well so far. So our next move is the air dash. We could probably model this action entirely with nodes as well, but it would get a little messy, so I prefer to create a custom task for it. So our custom task derives from enemy action and we can actually take our code from the jump action and use it as a base to save some time. So for the air dash, we want the boss to jump in the air, remain there for a while and then dash down towards the player. In start, we perform our jump, so just apply a vertical force. Then we create one more delayed call after which we start the build up. For that, we also need a separate tween. After our jump, we also set the gravity to zero in order to float in the air. We need to reset that value later, so let's store the default gravity in on awake. The dash is again very similar to the jump. Instead of an upward force, we apply a downward force. There are actually two different angles of the air dash based on the player position. So let's say if the distance to the player is below a certain threshold, let's say four, we do a steep angle, so y equals minus one, and otherwise a more flat angle, y equals minus 0 0.5. The update method we leave untouched, and in the end up method we add a third tween kill, and again restore the gravity to default, just in case the move has somehow been interrupted. Okay, so back in the behavior tree, we can copy and paste our ground dash branch and we'll call this one air dash and we will replace our jump action with our newly created air dash. So for the dash force, we have a value of 24, jump force 22, jump time 0 0.5, build up time 0 0.6. Oh, and now I forgot to add um, the third time parameter actually, which is the ch uh, dash time. So let's head back to our code and fix this. So we want another float dash time. And we want to add this here to this tween, which there is another mistake. This is also should be actually dash tween and not jump tween. So let's fix this one as well. And here let's insert our dash time. Okay, let's go back to the behavior tree and now we can fill in the right values. Actually, these two were mixed up as well. So jump time is 0 0.5, build up time 0 0.6, dash time 0 0.3. And our animation parameters are called start, air dash and air dash. We want the camera shake on landing and we also want to add a little jump effect. This time it's the air dash sparks with an offset of minus 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. And one more thing, um, there's another particle effect when we hit the ground. So we can just, um, after our air dash has been completed, we can add another node called play particles, which plays the particle system landing smoke big. Okay, so let's test this. 
And yes, again, this looks pretty good. Okay, our next move is the Gossamer Storm, which has two variations, either performed directly on ground or after a quick jump in the air. Since this will have a similar structure as the air dash, we again copy and paste the code to serve as a starting point. I couldn't quite figure out how exactly Hornet decides when to use the grounded versus the airborne Gossamer Storm, but for the sake of simplicity, we just use a random chance to decide. Now in the start method, we can keep the initial jump from the air dash, but we only want to perform it if we're doing the airborne version. Otherwise, we skip it and continue with the build-up phase right away. The build-up remains exactly the same and the action method we rename to start storm. In here, we first replace the set animation trigger with a set bool because the animation during the storm is a looping one. Now to create the actual storm object, so the sphere that is rotating around Hornet, we need to instantiate a new object which we'll call storm object. And before we can do that, we need to of course add a reference to the prefab and also a storm offset to better control the position. So we instantiate it and we also set uh, its direction, so uh, the local scale to always face Hornet. And finally, when the move is over, we set the animation pool to false, restore default gravity and destroy the storm object. And I think there is a slight camera shake when the storm appears, so let's add that as well. And in on end, it's also important again to clean up to remove the storm object in case anything went wrong. All right, back to Unity. So again, we create a new branch for our new move and call this Gossamer Storm. And add the action that we just created. So the values here for the airborne chance we leave 0 0.5. The jump force will be 10. Jump time 0 0.2, build up time 0 0.8, storm time 1.6. And our animation parameters are called start sphere and start sphere air for the air version. And the main animation bool is called is sphere active. And let's take a look at the storm object, which I've also already created. Basically also just a sprite animation with an added circle collider, uh, which is a trigger and the hazard component, which um, hurts the player when entering. And it's also notable that it's on layer player only, so that it's only interacting with the player. So let's track this in here as well and set the storm offset to have a Y component of one. Okay, let's test this again. So this one is the ground version of the Gossamer Storm. If we enter, then we are hurt. And here we go with the airborne version, which is done after a, a quick jump in the air. Perfect. We are already at our final attack, the needle throw. Let's use the Gossamer Storm as our base this time. Structure-wise, it's again very similar, but we only have two phases, build up and throw. So let's move the separate build up code to the start method. We can keep the set bool and also the object instantiation. Let's just rename the object to needle. And at the same time, we can remove some of the unused variables. Now for the needle throw, we also keep it simple and just use our tweening library as well. The throw is kind of a yo-yo or boomerang motion. We use the do move x method to move our needle to a given x position with a given duration. To queue multiple tweens, we use the do tween dot sequence method to which we can append an arbitrary number of tweens that are then executed one after the other. So we start with the forward movement. We introduce three more variables, a throw distance, a throw time and a retract time. We then move the needle horizontally to the current position plus throw distance times our direction. And this should take as long as our throw time. To get a proper motion curve, we set the easing for this tween to ease.out cubic. Next, we copy this, 
part and adjust the values for the backward movement of the needle. So just go back to Hornet's position, use the retract time and for easing we use in quad this time. In addition to tweens we can also append callbacks to our sequence. So let's add a callback at the end in which we perform our usual clean up tasks. And finally let's add another one between the movements to add this needle thread effect that plays once Hornet retracts her needle. For the effects we also need to add two more prefab references. So sprite renders which I call throw effect and retract effect. And while we're at it let's also add one more sprite effect when starting the throw. And finally in the on end we need to do our usual cleanup tasks. Okay, back in Unity we create yet another branch for our needle throw, replacing this action with our newly created throw needle and inserting the values. So throw distance is about 12, build up time 0 0.9, throw time 1, retract time 0 0.4 and our animation triggers are called start throw and the boolean is called is throwing. For the needle prefab, I've already created a prefab similar to the Gossamer Storm. So this is also using a collider and a hazard to hurt the player. And for the needle spawn offset, we insert 0 0.5 as a Y component. And then we have two effects, which are throw sparks and needle thread. All right, let's test this. So Hornet is throwing her needle and if we accidentally hit it, we are hurt. So everything seems to work. Now with our main attack moves done, we will finish off by implementing some of Hornet's movement. First, there are these big leaps, which we'll just implement as a randomly selected move because I'm not exactly sure when exactly they appear originally. So let's just use our good old jump action. For the values I'm using a horizontal force of 4, a jump force of 20, build up time 0, 1, jump time 1.4. The animation trigger is just called jump, no main animation this time. And then there are these retreat leaps whenever Hornet got hit by the player. For that we need to create a new conditional task that files when the enemy is hit I'm calling the task detect attack hit and it derives from enemy conditional since it will be used for a conditional abort. On the destructible component there is already an event called on hit which is exactly what we need. Now we bind a method to this event in which we set a flag variable is getting hit and then in on update we just return success or failure based on the state of that flag. And finally, in on the end, we just reset the flag to false. Now in the behavior tree, we just add a separate branch with a sequence with a conditional abort set to lower priority, meaning all running branches to the right will be aborted once this conditional succeeds. And as the conditional, we just use our new detect attack hit. And finally, for the retreat leap, we just again use our jump node with the following values, a horizontal force of minus 12, since this will be a, a backward jump, a jump force of five, build up time zero one, jump time zero four, and again, uh, for the animation trigger, the jump value. And I've also, in the meanwhile, uh, connected all of the attack moves to our stage-based selector and added them to this little sequence with comma separated values. Now if we test this we should have a fairly random selection of all of the moves we've implemented and if we are hitting Hornet she should do this little retreat leaps. Looks good. Finally Hornet runs around occasionally either to get away from the player or to get closer 
Again, it's hard to reproduce the original behavior exactly, but we'll come close. So let's create a new action called patrol. Add two variables, one for move speed and another for minimal distance. So at what distance we want to keep the player. This will determine whether to move towards or away from the player. We'll also specify our running animation parameter. In start, we get the difference between the enemy and player's X position. Then the player direction is the sign of the difference, so minus one or one. And finally, we check whether we are within our min distance. And accordingly, we set our move direction to player direction or opposite of player direction. Then in on update, we just assign a constant horizontal velocity to our rigid body and set the X scale to always face the moving direction. We want to use this task as a fallback, so we'll return as status of running to just continue forever and only be interrupted by other tasks. And in on end, we reset our animation pool. So back in our behavior tree, we add our patrol action, but then we realize that there isn't really a good way to use this as a fallback task with the current setup. We have this forever repeating loop of attack moves, which is only interrupted when the boss is hit or dead. We actually want the patrol to be the lowest priority task interrupted by attack moves. And we'd also rather want the retreats when hit to be lower priority than attack moves. So my solution in that case is to introduce a conditional called check for periodic event, which simply has a timer with an interval and triggers every time the timer runs out. So for that, we use a shared float, a concept which I've also explained in the previous video. It's basically a variable that is stored in the behavior tree and can be modified across tasks. So back in our behavior tree, we can replace our fight loop, our repeater with a sequence set to conditional abort lower priority. And as a conditional, we add our new check for periodic event. So there we also have to create our shared float variable, our periodic timer on the behavior trees blackboard. And we assign it here. Now with this new structure, we can also simplify things a little. For instance, we have this face player, in almost all of the branches. So we can just remove them from there and add it on top of this before our stage based selector. And after the stage based selector, so after the attack move has been executed, we want to reset our shared float, so our periodic timer to zero. Finally, we can hook up our patrol task as the lowest priority. And if we now test it, oh, we can see that we haven't yet uh, properly set the values for our movement. So let's do this. Um, so the proper values are a move speed of six and the min distance of four. And if we now execute it, yes, it looks better. So Hornet is doing this little bits of running and then switching back to perform an attack move, but always falling back to running again. Okay, there is one more thing I'd like to improve. We are still using our stage based selector from last time when there were different set of moves for different stages. For Hornet, as we analyzed in the beginning, we don't have this anymore, but rather it looks like moves are selected based on her position within the arena. So what we want is a selector where we can define a list of possible children, so attack moves, being selected based on the boss's relative arena position. To determine this arena position, let's split up the arena into three segments the boss can be in while facing the player. Corner, center and close up. Corner, for instance, means the boss has at least two thirds of the arena in front of her. Center, at least one third and close up means the boss is close to facing the wall. So with that in mind, let's build our custom selector task to save time. Let's again use our custom stage based selector from last time as a base. There we had a list of strings, each describing which children based on their index are included in this re respective stage using comma separated values. 
Let's keep the idea of having strings with comma separated values, but this time we have a fixed amount of three states, corner, center, close up. So instead of the list, let's just create three variables for these. Now we only need to find out in which arena segment the boss is in and then parse the according string and assign the child indices. Let's create an enum for our segments and then a function that returns the current segment. First, we need a relative position within the arena, which is just the absolute position of the boss minus the center of the arena. To get access to the arena dimensions, there is a reference on our new boss config component, which we added in the beginning. So we have the relative position. Now we want a normalized value between minus one and one, which is independent of the arena size. For that, we just divide our arena position by the radius to get the normalized arena position. Finally, we want to multiply this by the boss's facing direction to be independent of where she is looking. Now we can say if our normalized position is less than minus 0 0.33, so approximately in the first third, we are in the corner. Else if it's less than positive 0 0.3, we are in the center and otherwise we are close up. Now in on start we assign the right string based on the enum value. For this we can use the compact switch expression for instance. And finally this tasks value is passed on to parse the child indices. Now back in Unity we can replace our stage based selector with the new arena based selector and define the possible attacks for each segment. I don't know if that's perfectly accurate, but I would say corner includes all attacks other than the gossamer storm. So indices 0, 1, 2 and 3. Center, everything other than the needle throw. And for close up, we only allow the leap and the gossamer storm 3 and 4. All right, let's test this. It's obviously a little harder this time to test um, every single case here, but to me it looks like it's doing its job. Now for the very final touch, let's add a proper recovery stage, which Hornet enters three times after taking 11 hits each. It's basically just a few effects followed by a bit of knockback and entering the recovery animation. Then she waits for another hit before coming back to the fight. In the behavior tree, we can use the recovery branch from last time. First, we do a little time freeze plus a camera shake. Next, we can use the retreat jump action and paste it in here with the same values. Then we set the animation parameter stun. And then we wait for an attack hit. We have already created the conditional detect attack hit before. But currently, it's just checking once and returns immediately. So we want to add a few lines of code to allow it to be used to return running until a hit has been detected. Let's add a variable wait for hit, where we can set whether we want to wait or not. Then we alter the on update to return running when wait is active or failure when it's not. Finally, in on start, we need to reset the flag to false when wait is active because the hit event could have been raised at some point before the task is executed. So the flag would already be true. Okay, and finally, let's set the stun recovery trigger to get back into normal. And also let's reset the health, this time to 55 to allow 11 hits. And then finally call go to next stage. All right, let's do some final testing.
Okay, I think it's a pretty good approximation of Hollow Knight's original Hornet boss fight. Obviously, there are many, many more details uh, in the original, many more effects that work far better in terms of timing and so on. And of course, uh, Hornet's most important feature is missing her screams. But I think we covered most of the basics what make up this boss fight. And hopefully you learned a little bit more about the anatomy of a good boss fight, as well as how to implement it with behavior trees using Unity. Have fun with your game development journeys and cheers! Cheers!